In this lecture, you'll learn about flex falls. That's our flexible volumes. Volumes are the lowest level in the ONTAP architecture that clients can access data at. And when we talk about volumes in general, we're talking about flexible volumes. Let's have a real quick refresher on the storage architecture again. So you know already that volumes go into our aggregates and from the last lecture on SVMs, your volumes are associated with owned by a particular SVM. So now you know that when we talk about volumes, we're talking about flexible volumes. Why do we have that term? Well, there used to be traditional volumes way back in the day. They're deprecated a long time ago. You can't even use them anymore. And when ONTAP first came out, it only supported traditional volumes. These traditional volumes had a one-to-one -one relationship between the volume and its aggregate. So there was one volume, one aggregate. You could not put multiple volumes in the same aggregate. And if you wanted to resize the volume because it was tied to the aggregate, you had to physically add or remove disks from that aggregate. So then NetApp came out with flexible volumes. And when these first came out, you had the choice. You could either use traditional volumes or flexible volumes, but there were no advantages at all to using traditional volumes, only bad things. So NetApp kept support for both for a while to maintain backwards compatibility, but because nobody would ever choose to use traditional volumes, they were phased out. We just have the flexible volumes now as compared to the traditional volumes. Flexvols break that one-to-one -one relationship between an aggregate and a volume. So now you can have multiple volumes in the same aggregate. And because of the way that they work, you can now use thin provisioning to allocate more space to the volume than is actually physically available in the underlying aggregate. We're gonna be talking about thin provisioning in detail in a later section. For now, what you need to know is that, say for example, that you have got a 20 terabyte aggregate, well, you can actually make it look to the clients that there is 50 terabytes of available space there. So you can make the amount of space look bigger than it really is. And this allows you to actually buy the physical disks just when you actually need them. And another thing you can do with your flex vols is you can non-disruptively grow, shrink, and move them. So all of those things you could not do with traditional volumes, Flex vaults are much more flexible. That's why they're called flexible volumes. Let's look at how volumes are allocated space in an aggregate. So as you just learned, you can have multiple volumes in the same aggregate. For example, let's say that we've got aggregate one here and we've got three volumes using that aggregate. That's volume one in SVM one, volume two in SVM one, and we've also got volume one in SVM two. You learned about SVMs in the last lecture. You know that they've each got their own separate independent namespaces. So it's no problem to have a volume one in SVM one. We could have another volume with the same name, volume one in SVM two as well. And because aggregates work at the cluster level, they're not assigned to a particular SVM. We can have different volumes from different SVMs all using shared aggregates. So let's say for our example here, that we write some data for volume one in SVM one. It will use the first blocks that are available in the aggregate. And with ONTAP data is written in 4K blocks. Then for example, we write some data into volume one in SVM two, it will use the next available blocks. We then write some data for volume two, and then we write some data for volume one again. So the point here, is that the available space on the aggregate is shared by all the volumes and that the space is given out on a first come first serve basis. Now our flexible volumes are the basic building block of data management. They are a big deal in ONTAP. They can be non-disruptively moved or copied between different aggregates. 
They can be cloned. They're the unit of replication for snap mirror and snap vault. Snapshots are managed at the volume level. There's also aggregate level snapshots supported as well, but for your day-to-day -day snapshots that you're going to be using, they're going to be volume level snapshots. And deduplication, compression, and compaction, that also works at the volume level as well. A new feature is that aggregate deduplication is also supported just on AFF systems. So you can see that volumes are the main basic building block of data management in ONTAP. Now, I'm going to put a line in the slide here just so I can tell you that everything below the line is going to be covered in detail in later sections. I just wanted you to know right now that volumes are very important and on tap and the basic unit for most management. Okay, the data SVM namespace. We covered this in the last lecture about SVMs, I want to give you some more detail on it here now that we're talking about volumes. Each SVM has its own unique namespace, which is its directory structure. When you create a data SVM, its root volume is created, and each data SVM has got its own independent root volume and namespace. No user data should be placed in an SVM root volume. It's possible to do that, but it's bad practice to do so. You'll see why when we get to the data protection section. To build the namespace, volumes within each SVM are related to each other through junctions and they're mounted on junction paths. The root volume resides at the top level of the namespace hierarchy. Additional volumes junction paths lead back to the root volume. And when NAS protocol clients connect to a volume, volumes lower in the tree are visible as subdirectories. So you knew most of that information from the last lecture on SVMs, but I want to talk to you here about that last point about how the volumes are going to be visible to NAS clients. So looking at the same example again from earlier, we've got two different SVMs. We've got a Department A SVM, it's got its root volume and it's got volume one and volume two mounted directly under there. And we've got a department B SVM. It's got its own root volume and it's got its own volume structure under there. Obviously, these the SVMs and the volumes will have been created by you, the administrator. Now, let's say that a Windows client maps a network drive to the department B root volume. Well, it will see everything under there as a subdirectory. So you can see it in the picture on the right here. So a client has mapped a drive. For this example, it's mapped its Z drive to the department B root volume. To be able to do that, you need to have shared the root volume. You'll see how to do that when we get to the NAS section. So that's been done. The user has mapped the drive, and because you've got these volumes underneath there, the user will see that namespace as a directory structure underneath where they have connected. So in our example, volume one and volume Y are directly under the root volume. You can see that in the directory structure here. Volume X is under volume one, as you can see. Volume two is under volume Y and volume three is under volume two. So that's exactly how it's going to look to the client. In this next example, the client has mapped a drive to volume Y. So they will see all the volumes underneath there as subdirectories. So they've mapped their Y drive to volume Y for this example. And they can see volume two as a subdirectory in the volume Y, and they can see volume three as a subdirectory of volume two. So they see everything below that point. They do not have any visibility of anything higher up in the tree or hanging off of different branches. So they can't see the root volume, they can't see volume one, and they cannot see volume X. Okay, so that's how it looks for our NAS clients. Looking at SAN clients now. I'm going to cover this in way more detail when we get to the SAN section, but just so you can see how it works for now, our LUNs go into either a volume or into a Q tree. We're going to be covering Q trees later in this section. In the example, the administrator has created LUN 1 and we've put it in volume Y, and then we've got a SAN client which is using LUN1. So in our example, it's using LUN1 as its C drive. The LUN is a completely self-contained unit. 
The LUN is how the storage system presents a virtual drive to the client. So in our example, the client is using LUN1 as its C drive. It can put its own files and folders under there. As you can see here, it's got no visibility of the rest of the structure of the namespace. So LUN completely self-contained. Okay, moving on. So talking about how we're going to actually build the volume junction paths to build our namespace. When you create a volume in System Manager, that volume is going to be automatically mounted directly under the SVM root volume. You can change the junction path later if you want to. So I'll just go back a few slides again here. So in our example, let's say that you are the administrator working on the department B SVM you create volume one in the GUI, it's going to be automatically mounted directly under the root volume, as you see here. If you also create volume Y, it will also be mounted directly under the root volume. If you then create volume X, when you create that volume in the GUI, it is also going to be directly mounted underneath the root volume, not under volume one. So if you wanted to change that, if you wanted to have it mounted under volume one instead, what you would do is, first off, you would unmount it, and then you would remount it again with a different path under volume one rather than directly under the root volume. Okay, going back to where we were. So that was what happens when you create a volume in System Manager, in the GUI. It's a bit different when you use the command line. When you do create a volume in the command line, it is going to be unmounted by default meaning it is inaccessible to clients. For clients to be able to access a volume, you need to create the volume, you need to mount it into the namespace, and you need to configure your NAS protocol to make it available to clients. That last bit about configuring the NAS protocol, that's gonna be covered in the NAS section. So with the command line, it's not mounted by default, you need to explicitly do that. You can optionally do it as part of the volume create command when you first create the volume. And when you do that, you use the junction path field as part of the volume create command. So I'll show you the volume create command in the next lecture when we do the lab demo. When you do it, you'd say volume create, you specify the V server that this volume is going to be associated with. You specify the name of the volume, the aggregate that it's going to be in, the size of the volume, that's all the mandatory fields. And then optionally, you can also add the junction path field to specify how it's going to be mounted in the namespace. Now, if you forget to add that junction path field, which is very easy to do, it's something that I do all the time. The first time that you do that, you're going to be confused because the normal way to change any of the settings on a volume is with the volume modify command. But if you have created a volume, so you've done the volume create, you forgot to add the junction path, you're like, oh, I need to do that. And you say volume modify and you look to specify the junction path, it's not possible to add it with the volume modify command. We have to use a different command and that is the volume mount command. So to mount the volume in the namespace, either do it during initial creation with the volume create command, use that junction path field, or you can use the volume mount command later. Also, if you want to move it later, then use the volume unmount command to unmount it first, and then the volume mount command to change the location. Okay, the last thing to talk about in this lecture is the data SVM root volumes versus the node root volumes. It's really easy to get confused between the two. So I'm gonna explain it to you here clearly so that that is not gonna happen. So you know already about the admin SVMs. We've got the, the cluster and we've got also the node SVMs as well, one for each node. We've got vol zero, which is where the system information is saved, and that is associated with our node SVMs. Vol zero for the system information is known as the node root volume. That is different than the SVM root volumes. So each node in the cluster has its own vol zero node root volume. The node root volumes are owned by the node SVMs, 
They contain that system information and logs. The information is replicated between all the vol zeros and all the nodes in the cluster. And no user data can be stored in vol zero. It's just used for system management. So if we look at the node root volumes here for our two node cluster in this example, we've got a node one SVM and a node two SVM. They have both got a vol zero. That is the only thing in their namespace and that is the node root volumes. Whenever you hear me talk about it, I just call it vol zero because I think that's clearer. But in other documentation, you'll often see that being described as the node root volumes. So we can compare that with our SVM root volumes for our data SVMs. So you see here, we've got our department A SVM with its root volume, the department B SVM with its root volume. Those data SVM root volumes are very different than vol zero, the node root volumes. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.